Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about the neuromuscular factors in force production. Uh, so there are several neuromuscular factors that affect muscle force. Some we've talked about in past videos and some that we'll talk about new here. Uh, so fiber type, of course, is going to affect force production. Um, type one uh, fibers are smaller and produce less force. Um, and then increasingly more force as the fibers get larger up until we get to our largest type 2B fibers. Uh, so that's gonna significantly affect how much force each individual fiber is going to be able to produce. Um, the number of motor units recruited is going to be important. So how many uh, motor units we recruit, and then of course the size of those motor units that we're recruiting. Size of motor units, I mean, how many fibers are in that unit. So we have one motor neuron to X number of fibers. So fewer fibers is a smaller motor unit, more fibers is a larger motor unit. So how many motor units we recruit and how big they are is of course gonna significantly affect how much force we're producing. Uh, the frequency of stimulation is really important or the firing rate. Uh, like I discussed in my last video. Um, so how quickly or how close together those action potentials are arriving is going to affect whether we have summation or not, where the twitch contractions are adding together and therefore whether we achieve fused tetanus. And then finally, the temperature of the muscle is going to make a difference in how much force that muscle is able to produce. So we'll talk about that now. All right, so starting with motor unit recruitment, um, so fiber type, of course, partially determines the amount of force each fiber is able to produce. The size of the motor units that are recruited partially determines how much force each motor unit can produce. So depending on how many fibers a motor unit has, it can produce more or less force. Um, and so a motor unit composed of five muscle fibers will produce less force than a motor unit composed of 100 muscle fibers, assuming that the fibers are the same type. Uh, it gets harder to compare if we're comparing like um, a type one motor unit of a thousand fibers compared to a type 2B motor unit of 100 fibers. In terms of total amount of force production, it's probably not enough information to be able to tell which one of those would produce more force uh, because a larger motor unit, so more fibers, will produce more force than a smaller one. But what if those fibers are of different types and the type 2B can produce a significantly greater amount of force than the type 1 fibers? Okay, the number of motor units recruited partially determines the amount of force produced by the whole muscle. Okay, so how many motor units are we recruiting within a muscle? Uh, that's going to determine how much the whole muscle is producing a force. Okay, if we look at our picture on the left here, um, all the way on the left, uh, A, shows the recruitment of small motor units. So small motor units meaning few fibers within each motor unit. So with each motor unit recruited, where we go zero, one, two, three, as we go up in the number of motor units that we recruit, we have a very gradual kind of small increase for each motor unit because they're small. Uh, compared to B, where we have recruitment of large motor units. Again, just referring to how many fibers are in the unit, not how big the fibers themselves actually are. So here, where we have zero, one, two, three, four, five number of motor units recruited, we have much bigger increase in force for each one because those motor units are large. Okay, the frequency of stimulation, like I talked about in the last video, um, also called rate coding or firing rate. It's the rate of action potentials being delivered by the motor neuron. Um, so a higher frequency means that they're coming closer together. Uh, there's less time for the contraction to reverse or less time for a relaxation to take place between the action potentials. So in that case, each contraction builds on the previous one um, because there wasn't enough time for a full relaxation to happen. Uh, when the action potentials are arriving so close together that there's no rest in between, we call it fused tetanus, or usually just tetanus, we're, we're referring to fused tetanus if we leave out the fused part. Um, so if we specifically want to say incomplete or unfused tetanus, we will, but just tetanus by itself, we're referring usually to fused tetanus. 
All right, so how temperature controls force production. Uh, the temperature of the muscle and the motor neurons is important. So increased temperatures speed the movement of ions. So since the movement of ions is exactly what's happening for an action potential to take place and for muscle contraction to occur, that means that increased temperatures are going to cause faster action potentials and a faster muscle contraction. Okay, so increased tissue temperatures cause action potentials to travel more quickly in both nerves and muscle fibers. I'm just going back for one second here. Um, that's part of why it's you know, advised to warm up before any kind of athletic activity or athletic competition. Um, it's partly for the health and the viscoelastic properties of your tissues. But when it comes to performance, you're going to perform better when your tissues are at a higher temperature. And that's largely because the action potentials and the muscle contractions are occurring faster. Um, so faster in this context is going to mean better performance. Um, this won't really affect the force velocity curve because this isn't saying that we're contracting faster to the extent that our sarcomeres can't form cross bridges. Um, what we're saying is that we're able to achieve a normal amount or speed of contraction because the tissues are warm enough for the action potentials to travel. Um, so this allows for more cross bridges to form more quickly um, as opposed to in colder tissues where the ions are moving more slowly. The commands don't arrive as quickly. So it's not that the sarcomeres are shortening faster per se, it's that they get the signal to shorten sooner. Uh, so it's not affected by the force velocity curve because it's not the shortening rate, it's the speed that they receive the signal and therefore can start shortening sooner. Okay, uh, so that's all I have for you here and I'll see you in the next video.